Hello? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will be starting in a few minutes. Um, can I ask you to come to the front of the, of the tent? Because we actually want to make this engaging where we interact with, uh, with you. You're going to have a part in it, and so it'll be a lot easier if, uh, if you're sitting up front. Please come to the front so you can enjoy uh, you can enjoy the the discussion and be part of the discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this, uh, this panel on uh, using blockchain uh, for transforming uh, food systems. Um... Think ahead to 2050. 
We're going to need about 70% more uh, food than we need today to feed the population then. We have to find solutions to build a better place for the next generation. So we are really looking for the change makers. When I'm together with farmers, we are in a too small uh, circle and uh, circling around. I prefer to be with uh, people from everywhere. They give you the new answer for the future. The summit will help people to get real about technology, to really understand why it's important, what it can do and what it cannot. So uh, let me give some really quick introductions so you know who, uh, who is here uh, today. Uh, I'm Gideon, Gideon uh, Kruzman. I lead the community of practice on socioeconomic data and uh, um, uh, within the, our community of practice, we have a working group uh, on blockchain, the Blockchain Coalition. Um, the other, our other panel members, go ahead. Try again? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. So my name is Marika. Um, I am the founder of The Fork. The Fork is a company that is completely focused on blockchain technology for agri-food uh, because we see that it, it's a real new generation of technologies that can bring food system into the next world where we are moving towards. We're based in the Netherlands and we train on blockchain technology and we implement technologies with uh, agri-food companies, and that is with farmers, uh, but also with big retailers. Thank you. Thanks, Gideon. Thanks, Mario. Uh, my name is Rama. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer of B-Hub, um, and I think my blockchain experience uh, dates a little back uh, from my CIO role today. Um, I have helped build India's first and only uh, blockchain protocol platform. Um, I am also part of the Indian Committee for Standards on Blockchain. I also represent India on various uh, blockchain forums, including uh, Asia, Korea, etc. Uh, filed multiple patents on blockchain. So I understand the topic um, significantly okay. And we are here to discuss about how blockchain and food security can come together. What is the value and impact? Um, so we'll kind of, you know, if there is anything as Gideon mentioned before, one, uh, come closer as much as possible, and then um, we'll be happy to kind of open up the floor for questions and kind of unravel the space as we talk more. So uh, the objective of the panel that we have now is, is to discuss uh, with you uh, whether digital trust and transparency technologies, of which blockchain is an, uh, is an example, are, uh, are necessary. Uh, obviously not sufficient, but necessary to create the enabling environments to transform food sy uh, systems in order uh, to feed the world by 2050 while staying within the planetary boundaries. And that's the major uh, 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 goal that we, that we have, which is, yeah, it's difficult to, uh, to achieve, and it's certainly not, not going to happen if we do things business uh, as usual. So uh, I'm going to give the hand it over to Marika to give a presentation on what we've been doing. Yeah, and that is the clicker, right? Okay. Um, so we're starting something new, and it's called Strike Two. Strike Two comes from sports, and um, some of you might know what sports. Um, and it really is aimed to emphasize the sense of urgency that we have. And I think this is the, um, everybody here knows that sense of urgency. Now, within Strike 2, we believe that technology is a big enabler for that. And we think that we have enough technologies, we don't need new solutions, but we need to use the solutions that we have better. Now, I just want to uh, highlight a few things on blockchain and really why we have blockchain today and why we all should be thinking about blockchain and preferably working with blockchain. Um, basically, we're in the next industrial revolution. Uh, you call it the fourth, or you can call it the fifth, or the third, but we're in a new way of organizing. And it was brought to us already five 
years ago uh, in the, the, the more global media. But blockchain as a technology is more than, uh, it's, it's, it's 10 years old. La at the beginning of this year, it was officially 10 years. Um, so it's to some extent, it's a technology that is a combination of technologies that we have been working on uh, for even more than 10 years. The reason why I emphasize that, that it's an old technology that in the combination uh, that is called blockchain is really opening up newer opportunities. Now, this picture I think is critical and I hope that if anything you remember this one because it basically says that we're moving, we're moving that direction and it means that we're moving from decentralized systems into what we call distributed systems. And uh, who, who's come here by an Uber today? Okay, that's a few. That, that's a decentralized business model. Facebook, Airbnb, I think all of us know pretty much quite a few of them. We probably use quite a few of them. And they're decentralized models. Now, there's a limit to the growth of a decentralized model. And that's why we are moving towards a distributed model. A network model, a model where everybody uh, is much more uh, autonomous in deciding what they're doing. This is a, a graph, it's, the, uh, it's, it's from, uh, from Gartner, it's called the, the, the hype graph. Um, what you see here, any technology can be plotted on this graph. So it has time over visibility. And what it indicates here is that blockchain is often, uh, I think, infamous because of cryptocurrencies. So financial, fi the financial market in some ways is much broader and much further developed for its technological advancements. Food is a bit more behind to some extent, but I also think food is much more complex. It's much more fundamental, but it's also much more complex. So in terms of the blockchain used in the, in the, the sphere of food, it's more uh, uh, exactly where you see the, the little dots just uh, at the bottom of the hill. It basically said that we had this real sort of hype on blockchain, then we got all very negative and very deception and very um, real about what it can really do, we realized, well, it can do only a few things and probably better than the other technologies that we have. And now we're gonna use it in a much more realistic fashion. So this is where we are. This is uh, a research uh, done by Capgemini. Um, and it basically asked the, the companies who are investing in blockchain why they invested in blockchain. What you see here um, is that what I really like, is because in food we always talk about the power of traceability and transparency. But what it says here is that the first and foremost reason to start blockchain technology is because of cost savings. If uh, in a financial market it has been calculated that it actually saves 80% costs, it's 8-0, in terms of uh, settlements, financial settlements. Uh, on the, on, for you, that's that side. On the outer side of the spectrum of why you would use it, there's the, the, the promise and expectation of creating new business models. And it's on that side that we think there's uh, m much more to gain. Now, just to have some basic understanding before we had the discussion, this is a, uh, the most simple definition that we could think of. Uh, it's pretty much a database. It resembles a database. It's not a database, but it resembles a database that has three characteristics that we think it's important to stipulate here. It, have, it has more characteristics, but for now, it's permanent. So once it's in the blockchain, it can never get out. We had a discussion during lunch on the rubbish in, rubbish out. Uh, so if there's rubbish in, there's rubbish forever. <laughs> yeah. So it's a good... It's a good thing, but it's also a complicated thing. The second one is it's auto-synchronized. So once a transaction is added to a blockchain network, it is all visible to everybody in the network. In um, agriculture, to have real-time data, up-to-date data, we all know, is a very strong asset. And the third one, and that's the most difficult one, it's neutral. Uh, one definition that I still really like is uh, there are rules, but there's no ruler. So we have rules, but no one is the boss. 
and after we give trainings and after two days of full-time training, they still ask, so who owns the blockchain? Who starts it? Who's the boss? Who really decides? So I think this third uh, characteristic is something we really need to work on. It's about governance, and I think that's where the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity lies. Now, this is our food system. Uh, this is sort of the, the digital part, the digital copy of our food system. Um, who doesn't recognize this? Yeah, so the, I, I'm keen to speak to you uh, after, uh, or, or either you have to come more in front so we can have a stronger interaction. Um, I'm really keen why you don't recognize this, but overall we have a lot of silos, we have a lot of databases that actually do not really communicate, and that renders quite a lot of inefficiency, but it really limits the, 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 the impact of our food system. Now, if you put blockchain against that, you get the following. Um, and this is the most technical we'll get. But you see these little keys at the beginning. So you see the, the, the upper flow is the physical flow of food, the physical flow where you go from farmer up to fork up to the end consumer. The little keys, what, what we uh, aim to, significant, to, to uh, indicate with this is that you actually lock information at your own company uh, level or at your own farm level or whatever level you are. Now, once you've locked your information, you, uh, you hash it. And hashing means that you put it into something that nobody recognizes. It's like a Sudoku puzzle. So you see it's there. It's easy to solve. So it's easy to decide whether it's true or false. But it's very difficult to solve. To, um, um, to, yeah, it's difficult to solve. But it's easy to, um, to check. That's what I wanted to say. And then it's added to the block. So the next in line in the supply chain does the same, and the next, and the next. So this is how a blockchain is actually built up. Now, important here is that with the keys, you actually protect your data. So this is a huge misconception that people think that blockchain is an open system. It doesn't necessarily show your data. So it actually protects your data very well. And this is one of the things I think we need to talk about. Because a lot of people think it's something that's open and everybody now has transparency. This is not necessarily the case. In a block, you have these aspects. Um, I'm actually going to give one to Rama. Uh, Gideon already has one. So if you have a qu technical question on this, uh, ask, ask us. And they will be able to explain. So you have these two keys, there's a time, time stamp on it, um, there is a value, there is a signature that refers to me or the person who puts that information on the blockchain, and it is hashed uh, and uh, really connected to the other data that is there. And this makes the immutability. So because it really is added to already a history, you can't just take the information out. So that is what establishes the immutable aspect of blockchain. I just want you to be aware that it's part of the new way of organizing. So it's not a question whether or not blockchain is going to influence your work. It is influencing. And I think one of the things that we want to do here is to help you understand how and what it's going to do and how you can use it to do your work in, a, in, in the, the way you want to do it. Now, it's growing, uh, so C, the CAGR means the, the compounded aggregated growth rate. In, the use of blockchain in food is growing with about 60%. And uh, that is exactly why we want to help people to understand the technology itself. Now, the summit that we organized, um, the, the, the movement, I think it's more of a movement that we're starting and that we're calling Strike 2 has three events. The first event was just in September in the Netherlands. Um, and it was about consumer trust. So how can you use this technology to uh, establish consumer trust? The second event is it's exactly in one month, also in the Netherlands. Uh, and it's about farm income. So how can you use this technology to increase farm income? Um, and we will have three very concrete use cases showing you exactly how a technology increases the income of farmers. And the third topic of the events uh, is chain, uh, chain management and really circular chain management. Now, in here, we will show you very concrete examples. 
And one of the things that everything, I, I think we're all very aware, but technology is only, that, that's, that's indeed the easy part. Connecting technologies is a less easy part. And making technologies work for the things that we want to work on, SDGs, agricultural improvement, that is the real tough nut to crack. And I think that's the nut that we want to crack a bit just now, right? Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about uh, the strike two, over here uh, on the table, there is a bunch of stickers with QR codes on them, and uh, which will link you to, uh, to the Strike2 to, uh, Summit website. Okay. Uh, I don't have any slides. Sorry about that. Uh, I was expecting there is some gifts inside, but there is nothing. So, um, so one is obviously the, the best thing is to kind of get questions and then talk about it, but we'll wait till the end. Um, so we are talking about blockchain and food, right? So essentially, one thing that comes to mind is like, you know, smart food. And when anything to do with smart food, I always remember Joanna, who is like safely hiding behind in the back rows. Uh, she's been a big proponent of smart food, of how all this food, which are nutrition-based and all the healthier thing, right? So a lot of things that I learned from her about food in Ecrisat is thanks to Joanna. And uh, one thing that we started talking initially was how can blockchain add value to that? Uh, how can we make it much more smarter in terms of traceability, in terms of ensuring that when somebody says it is organic food, how do you those that you purchase? It is coming from a said farm, a said farmland, a said farmer base. And hence, there is a higher level of trust and authenticity that these are actually not uh, carbide, uh, ripened, but it is actually like you know naturally grown. Uh, and one experiment that we did at Ecreset was actually tracing uh, the destination of mangoes from source to the table, from farm to fork, and showing validation of that. In fact, this is an example. I'll tell you a, a quirky story. So I was presenting this use case to a central government department ministry, and uh, very smart guy. And obviously, I, I didn't expect that he will ask me, blockchain is complex to begin with, right? So it's very hard to explain to government people how blockchain works. Uh, but I tried, and I said, you know, it is, makes it better and stuff like that. He's like, OK, whatever. Then he said, now you tell this mangoes, like, you know, when you transport from the farmers, it comes through all this logistics vans, and it comes to your home. What happens if in the, like, you know, in the Jakartnaka or check post, you all understand check post, Jakartnaka, where you know, you need to kind of, you know, when it um, changes state or city, you need to pay and road tax and all of that. So when it stops, what if somebody takes the mangoes and changes it? And I'm like, I mean, technology can't help that. Uh, technology can only do that much if it is watertight, sealed, and all of that, right? If there is somebody who is intended to do malfunction, then technology can't help. If somebody is going to break a computer, compu computer can't kind of, you know, defend itself, you know, as a different parlance. So I think there is a limitation of what technology can do under the said contours. And practically, there are a lot of issues that still needs to be solved. And a lot of governance and government uh, fraternity needs to kind of back this. Again, one thing that we're discussing over lunch is uh, you need to pick the right use case, um, which kind of fits from an easy angle. Supply chain is one large one. Uh, agriculture and food is a very, very natural extension. I don't know why people have not picked that ahead of, say, FinTech and other areas. Um, so I think the other areas are like certifications, right? Whether it is birth certificate, death certificate, any kind of certificate issuance, degree certificate, which is kind of prone to a lot of malpractices. Uh, those are areas where blockchain comes in very handy, uh, where you can kind of uh, dip into the source of which university has issued, when it was issued, when it was revoked. Today there is no fund of revoking a certificate, right? Once it's issued, it's done for ages or for life. So I think blockchain kind of comes in handy where you don't need to have a certificate any longer. If there is an employer who wants a request, I mean, you can authenticate it. The degree goes from the university to the employer for the day that is issued, and that's about it. You don't need to kind of, and in this case, rather than a three-month verification process, it happens in half an hour, and the university gets to make a small slice of the payment that employer anyways pays a lot. So they now become part of the revenue source. So this is an example of how Trust transparency has increased. Uh, a passive participant like a university has become much more active. And he's providing what is called as the source of truth. 
and uh, it is faster and employee knows that this person is genuine and the degree is genuine, right? So those are examples um, that brings in a lot of confidence in what blockchain espouses, right? So, yeah. Um, I'd like to add a couple of examples uh, to that, for, uh, which come very close to what we what we do in in our work in uh, for agriculture for for the resource poor. Um, a lot of the uh, the farmers, the smallholder farmers, uh, in many parts of the world are uh, are facing issues uh, in terms of quality of their inputs. Uh, um, um, in some studies, uh, it's been estimated that in Africa, 70% of, uh, of inputs uh, is to some degree um, uh, uh, counterfeit. Uh, using blockchain, uh, because of the, the traceability that is uh, that's inherent in the, in, uh, in the system, um, you can actually... Um, start solving that problem. Blockchain isn't going to uh, take away the, um, uh, the counterfeit, but it makes it a lot easier to trace where, uh, how, uh, what, uh, where, it, where it comes from. And you can actually name and blame uh, whoever is responsible for, uh, for, 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 the, for the counterfeit. Because it's usually not the, the, the producer of the, uh, of the, uh, of the input. Uh, if it's a, a seed company, for instance, uh, but it's somewhere along the line something goes wrong, yeah? because it's really easy to kind of mix up that bag of good seed with a whole bunch of um, seeds that are uh, well, that are just ordinary seeds yeah? and not the improved uh, the improved seeds. Yeah? But using using these kind of technologies, you can uh, you can. Uh, you can uh, take that away. Uh, so it's, it's about that kind of traceability, both on the input side, but also on the output side, like, uh, like Rama already uh, mentioned. Um, and it actually makes it possible to, um, uh, to make uh, traits which are invisible visible. For instance, uh, biofortified food, uh, being able to, to, to distinguish between uh, what are biofortified commodities and non-biofortified commodities? Um, so there is a whole range of these kind of examples where uh, where it makes sense. Now, the really the big difference, um, which uh, with respect to using these kind of technologies in uh, in agri-food um, compared to fintech, is that. Um, uh, in the, fi the uh, financial world, uh, digital cr uh, the cryptocurrencies, it's a completely virtual world. Whereas when we're talking about agri-food, it's a virtual world which is put on top of a r the real world. So in addition to having um, a, the, uh, the, the, the digital trust uh, technology, uh, technology such as blockchain, you also need to have the kind of anchors which links this virtual world to the real world, which is about uh, using sensors, using remote sensing, using, uh, for instance, um, uh, taking pictures of, uh, of things with, your, with a phone which has a, um, a time and a geospatial stamp. Uh, so uh, Marika mentioned in the, the, the blockchain, because that, that's the, 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 the examples all come from originally these kind of virtual worlds where it says timestamp. In, uh, for the agri-food, it's not just a timestamp. It's also a geospatial stamp in many cases because you need to know, okay, where was that commodity at a certain, at a certain point in time? So... Um, if, do you have anything you want to add to this right now? Then um, I'd like to open this up for, uh, uh, for, uh, for you guys uh, to join in to the discussion. If you have any comments, remarks, or questions that you'd like to ask.
There was another mic. But, oh. Ah, there it is. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Kiran, and I am representing Hire My Farmer product. And uh, we are uh, connecting farmers with uh, uh, business people directly. And uh, we are introducing a uh, fintech model in uh, agriculture domain also. Uh, one of our business use cases is like we are planning to implement uh, uh, the farm, farm to fork uh, uh, business model using blockchain. Uh, my question is like, uh, uh, ca can I use uh, uh, the existing Ethereum J framework or uh, uh, Hyperledger uh, in order to implement this kind of business model? I mean, I have to use either private blockchain or public blockchain for this uh, form to for you. So your question is whether to use private or public blockchain? Yes. Is that so? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, that's a long answer. <laughs> but uh, basically, you can use both. Um, I think private blockchain are... Uh, they're more set for the commercial reality of today, but they're also less innovative. They do more of the same, but slightly different. Um, I'm a strong, uh, I, I think public blockchain has a very strong feature that we really need in agriculture. So the big difference in public is that everybody can check it. So there's no closed environment, the, 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 the key thing on uh, uh, private blockchain is that you have an agreement amongst a certain group of people or organizations and you share information amongst these people but it's not open to anybody outside and I think in agriculture uh, in terms of food being so critical so fundamental we need open um, accessible systems so I think for food public blockchain makes more sense than private but um, private is often much more geared to work with uh, the, the, the way we're used to work. And uh, my experience, it's very difficult to transform from private to public. It's more easy to transform from public to private. And I think the best solution is when you have a, 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 a public basic layer where you have your food safety information and your, the real important public information and you have a private closed layer on top of that. So I would, I would go for the combination. Thank you. Uh, Rama, you want hello, to everyone. Uh, my name is Prabir Mishra. I'm an investment banker. Two of my clients were working with a blockchain, one specifically on a smart cities, where in a big way, where um, bidding, we have already bidded, we have got seven LOIs from a smart city, Eastern Zone. Then also we are working with a lot of seed traceability and food traceability companies. Now here the dilemma is coming. When you talk about government initiative, with the data, data security, that is becoming a big challenge on the blockchain. And uh, how to address that? The second part of the question, when I'm working with seed or food traceability, yes, public blockchain is providing a good insight. So that part is mostly sorted out and that's adding a lot of value and we have seen that. But again, when you talk about the pricing issue, how to price the blockchain, there we are finding a lot of difficulties. Uh, that's, what's your thought on that? Thank you. Um, I think you just had too many things clubbed together. Um, so the actual thing got lost, but I think we can have a detailed conversation post that. So one, I think in terms of uh, data privacy or security, uh, blockchain happens to be much more secure. You know, so if it has to allay that fear. Also, there is various levels of uh, transparency that you can uh, code in in terms of who has to see a certain data segment, even if it's a consortia blockchain, you want few members to see some of the financial transactions and others need not and just have the records. That is also possible, right? Uh, it's not very clear to me whether you're trying to build a blockchain DAP, which is an application, decentralized application, or a platform, and what is it that you're trying to solve, right? So, um, um, to give a specific example on the smart cities, 
we are getting into the birth and death certificate, we are getting into the building permissions. So that sort of a things what we are doing. Now, uh, that's the validity because that's a big challenge in this country when you documents have been forged. Right. So uh, that's a good segment to get into. I mean, that's something that you were talking over the lunch. Uh, in fact, you should also meet block expert that is going to be here tomorrow issuing some certificates for the speakers and they do exactly that. So you should figure out how to kind of work with partners who do certain things well and not try to kind of, you know, like uh, bite a much larger piece which will get you nowhere. Also the other thing to answer is uh, why are you even thinking of blockchain? Uh, have you solved the solution without blockchain and blockchain does serve a purpose beyond that. So you need to think through various things, right? Today I think one thing that people get easily confused is, um, you know what, let's just throw in blockchain and maybe let's see if it kind of finds more traction or magic in there, right? Uh, that's not going to happen by default by itself. Uh, you need to figure why, and I think for most part, people don't have an answer. Uh, you don't even know why you're using blockchain. Is that an ask or is that something that you are putting in for ball string security, ball string decentralization or whatnot, right? Um, and I think work with people that already have uh, like Marike has uh, blockchain labs and they build a lot of solutions. So you may want to leverage some of the existing solutions and build either on top or adjacency to it. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Hey. I'll, I'll just ask. After me. Uh, yeah, so I'm Ram. I'm from Ikrisat. So uh, you see, crop insurance is a very big opportunity. And in India, especially crop insurance is also a big subject of contention, especially, you know, if it is weather index insurance, very often you will have farmers and the insurance companies challenging, right? So is, would it be, uh, would it be over optimistic to think that in the future, probably you can have a network of weather stations recording all their data on some kind of a blockchain platform, right? So that it becomes, uh, uh, you know, an, an, an uncontested data to be referenced both by the insurance companies and the farmers as well, so that we see uh, less bone of contention when it comes to claims and settlements. Yeah. A thought, and I'd love to hear your comments as well. Yeah. No, absolutely. That that is one of the that, that that's a very good example of uh, of an area where you have some you have something which is in place or uh, uh, but. It runs into problems because of the trust between the different par parties, because of asymmetric information, um, and um, uh, and where um, uh, there is a, there might be ways of uh, of addressing uh, addressing that, uh, like uh, the one of the one of the inspire challenge winner the uh, of 2017 uh, who won the uh, the scale up grant last year um, uh, that did these kind of insure uh, this insurance uh, here in india where they basically uh, w uh, worked with taking photographs of the uh, of uh, of the fields as a way of uh, 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 of linking what is happening in in the real world in the in the world with uh, with the insurance, uh, but that's in a very controlled environment. If you want to roll it out over millions of farmers, then yeah, you got you have a you ha you may have a problem there, uh, unless you have a way of um, ensuring that that kind of information cannot be tampered. Because it's way too uh, uh, there is on both on both sides of the scale. Uh, whether you're talking about farmers um, who who, kind, uh, who who are interested in yeah uh, taking advantage of the system, uh, or some farmers may be interested in taking advantage of the system. And on the other hand, you may ha you can have the insurance companies who want, who uh, don't want to uh, to pay. Uh, uh, pay uh, unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, so there is there 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 could be incentives um, uh, for uh, even if it's not just uh, the company, but it could be an individual agent who's trying to uh, to reach uh, reach his, uh, his or her targets, who has an incentive to you know uh, not completely comply by all the uh, all the rules. Whereas then using a uh,